Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you'd get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Chris Bates, welcome back to the Australian Investors Podcast, mate. Oh, and always good to chat, mate. Great to be here. Yeah, it is indeed, mate. We, um, we sat down a few weeks ago and we thought we should do a property investment series for our listeners because you and I and Amy, we put together a course for like first home buyers and um, basically anyone that's trying to enter the property market. But we haven't sat down and really talked about this huge asset class, which is property and for investors specifically, you know, everything they need to know about strategies and whatever. So we're going to spend um, the next five episodes of this mini series talking about investment property. We're going to cover things like, you know, why would we invest in property? That's today's episode. Uh, We're going to talk about, you know, how to use property effectively, whether you're in, you know, you're just starting out or you're in retirement. We're going to talk about upgrading, you know, the first time investor, the people that have those big portfolios, how those work. Um, and then we're going to talk about like exit strategies, like what's the end game. Um, so these are all coming up in the next episodes. But for today, mate, I thought we'd just, just start off with like, tell us a little bit about property in Australia. Like we know there's a huge affinity with it, but how big is it? Why are people interested in it? Let's just let's just riff from there. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's huge, right? I mean, we've got a $10 trillion property market. I mean, it was $9 trillion or $8 trillion or $7 trillion just a few years ago. And, um, you know, there's lots of people who are invested in the property industry, obviously the banks, you know, you've got homeowners, you've got investors, you've got, um, you know, there's a huge, lots of people have got their all their wealth tied up in property into their house. Um, you know, they, div, you know, just buy investment properties, et cetera. Um, there's a huge market, right? Um, and there's lots of interest. There's a construction industry that's supported off the back of it. There's lots of taxes that are, you know, given to, you know, councils and, you know, the state and federal governments, et cetera. So it's a big, big beast. I think that real difference with the property market versus other asset classes is that we live in it. You know, 70% of properties are, say, owned by people who live in them. Um, in some suburbs, that might be 90%, right? And so that suburb is really driven by not so much people thinking about things. Is this a good investment? No, I actually want to live here and I'm willing to go into a lot of debt or take on a, you know, pay out, put a lot of my capital to, to live there. So it's a real big difference to, you know, shares where, you know, there's no sort of living in an element. Mm. And I think this is a, I was actually going to start this with an example. I was chatting to my partner the other day and, um, for those of you that aren't watching, I'm sitting in my land room here recording, which is actually the, the property that um, Chris and his team helped me get into or helped us get into. Um, and I was thinking, I put this to my partner. I said, what would you do if a million dollars was credited to your bank account right now? And her first, her, her takeaway was, well, I'd probably pay off most of my mortgage, not all of it, but most of it. Um, and I instantly thought being a shares guy, I thought, oh, it's just, invest it, you know, I'll just put it straight in the stock market. I'll put it in shares, ETFs, whatever. Um, And then I thought back to something that we've spoken about in the past, which is actually, you probably don't need to buy shares with cash, meaning that you can, you could pay off your mortgage or get equity in your home. And this is a complicated strategy, which we'll talk about in the future episodes, but you could even do something like get a line of credit against your secured asset, which is your home and invest that money into shares. And then you get maybe some tax breaks um, maybe you get more leverage into that asset, knowing that the bank will lend to you against the house. And the reason that I bring this up, Chris, is that there's more ways than one to invest, no matter what asset class you're looking at. And property has that versatility, not just for living in, but also from a secured asset perspective. It's a really good point, right? The, the banks are um, obviously wanting to lend a lot on property values. They're very confident on their um, lending. It's probably they'll do it on a much smaller rate. They can leverage that money in terms of um, lending out a lot more money if it's secured by property. And so absolutely, you know, if you've got out assets like property, you can basically pull out growth, pull out equity, lines of credit, you know, equity release, and then go and invest in shares, et cetera. The key with that is that you can pull out your gains. You know, you don't have to sell the property, but you could pull out 80% of the gains, let's call it, 
um, without paying any capital gains tax. So if you, for example, buy a house or you buy multiple investment properties um, and you want your money back, well, as long as you've got the income there to basically borrow the money, then you don't have to lose liquidity um, forever. I mean, we've got a client who works in a in a big fund. He's like, you know, a, a basically a junior sort of fund manager, I guess you call it. Um, mm. And, you know, he came to us a few years ago and, um, you know, had four or 500 grand. And so what we did is we helped him buy, you know, a house in Sydney. Um, and he also bought an investment property in Brisbane, let's call it. Um, and both of those properties have gone up and it was only just recently, the last couple of weeks, where we've basically released back the same amount of money that he put in, which was like 500 grand. So he's now got two assets growing for him, but now he's got 500 grand equity release that he can go back into the markets. Um, and so he's, you know, for this, he's really lost access to that cash for a couple of years. But now he's got also two properties growing for him and he's got a tax deductible debt himself. So, yeah, absolutely. It, that, that sort of strategy you talk about there, Owen, though, it, the thing with property only makes sense when you can leverage, right? If you go and put a million dollars into the stock market versus a million dollars into the property market dollar for dollar, I would go shares every day of the week. Liquidity, um, ability to sort of sell down and diversify, take money off the table, et cetera, with a property you're in big transaction costs, buy and sell. Um, so when you're comparing dollar for dollar, absolutely shares wins every day. But with property, and we'll talk about it lots on these episodes, it's all down to the power of leverage. You know, mm-hmm. if you can, to buy a million dollar property, you probably need 150,000, right? Um, assuming you borrow at 90%. Yes, there's mortgage insurance, but, you know, that would still be, you know, a, a good sort of point to enter. And so 150 grand gets you a million dollar asset growing for you rather than, you know, try to put $150,000 into the stock market and then get a million dollars. You'd have to leverage it seven times. It'd be very hard to get any type of margin loan or, mm. or anything to go like that. Mm. And that, from, my, from where I sit, I feel like that would be very, very risky because of the volatility in prices, right? You get yeah. margin calls, you can just get wiped out so quickly. Um I was just actually looking at, as you were, you were talking through that, I was just looking at, there's a, a, a thing on the Vanguard website, which basically shows historical performance of major asset classes. And obviously past performance is not indicative of future performance, but I'm just looking at the, the return basically since January, 1990 through to the end of March, 2022 of, um, and I'll put the link in the show notes. So for full reference, so you can check it out. And um, this is basically just so people are aware, I'm, I'm not necessarily cherry picking the data. This is just when we can get the property um, sector returns from. Um, this is just before the, the last major recession before, before COVID. Um, so that was early 1991, 1990. And so the pr- Australian property, according to the data that I've got here, has compounded at about 8.7% per annum. Now, uh, Australian shares, by exa- uh, for example, have compounded at 9%. And the full assumptions, by the way, are available in the, sh- in the show notes there. <clears throat> but my point is that um, you know, the return profiles of these assets Uh, and not that dissimilar over time. Now, of course, there'll be volatility. And I think the key here, Chris, is that the way Vanguard was measuring this is basically of listed property. When we talk a lot about property in general, we're talking about private homes where it's not as liquid, um, where you might be buying one asset versus, you know, um, a basket of assets if you have a listed vehicle to do that through. And I think this is um, this is an important point because this is basically it's basically a real asset that we're talking about. Um, it's a tangible asset, and that comes with a whole bunch of different considerations, which we're going to talk to. Um, you've mentioned leverage being one of those things. The the where I was going with this point is basically the difference between you know just common property stock and a quality asset. Can you talk to talk to it generally speaking about when we talk about quality and when we talk about quality throughout the series? What do you mean by quality versus yeah. not quality? Yeah, and I think the interesting thing when you compare property and shares on returns, I think it's a bit of a pointless exercise, to be honest. And the reason mm. I'll say that is you don't buy the property market. You know, you can buy an ETF and buy the index, right, for the share yeah. market. We all know how that all works. You know, your listeners are very familiar with that, right? But you can't go and buy a residential property index and then go live in the property, right? You get the growth of what the property you purchased on that street, um, and, you know, you can't even really diversify with property because you'd be talking 500 grand here, 500 grand there, 500 grand there. And to be honest, the people who diversify in property, the people who go down the quantity strategy absolutely get the worst returns versus they want someone who went down the quality strategy. So the people who diversify hmm. actually would have been better being undiversified and going all in on a quality asset. So what is a quality asset? So, you know, it, it, you think about it being common sense. But unfortunately, the property market is completely unregulated. And that's the thing that any invest uh, listener has to always be thinking. No one here is watching out for me. You know, this is buyer beware. If I go and speak to any type of person in the property market, property specialist, property investment advisor, 
uh, real estate agent, buyer's agent, et cetera. Um, buyer's agent has got a little bit of, you know, uh, you know, regulation around them, but not too much. Um, and they can say what abs- anything they want and you can never go back and sort of say that was, that was right. So you need to really understand things when you're entering because you are taking a lot of debt and you're investing a lot of money, right? So what is a quality asset? So if you think about anything in life, it all goes back to demand and supply. And, and people really understand that, but then when they apply it, they, they sort of forget, right? So with property, what you want to own is really something that's got restricted and, or, and ideally decreasing supply. It sounds crazy. You know, mm. but if you think about houses, say, in the inner ring of a capital city, right, um, can they build any more houses in the inner ring? Said, no, because there's no land left, right? It's just, it's all built, right? But are they, is there less supply every year? Absolutely, because sometimes they knock them down to build townhouses and apartments. Sometimes they get acquired by the government to build train stations. And um, sometimes they, uh, lots of different reasons, right? So they've actually got shrinking supply over the longer term. But secondly, they've got um, shrinking supply because less of them turn over every year. Every every year, less people decide to sell their property. We're living in our properties longer than we ever have um, because the people can't afford to upgrade. We're living longer. Um, the costs to sort of transact are bigger um, and people you know, aren't trading as much, I guess. So the supply is you know, going down, but also the number of properties trading, the marginal buy is actually less. Um, but if you think about a high-rise apartment, it fails the supply test for a quality, quality investment, right? Because if there's one high rise, it's usually in an area where they're going to build more of them. So mm. it's not restricted supply, it's infinite supply, to be honest, because you could get high rises all over the city. If you think about greenfield house and land packages, is that restricted supply? Well, no, it is because there's only 300 lots in that development. But for, over the next five years, they're going to sell 2,000 of them and all the farms around you. The same as sort of new townhouses. Like if you think about a new town, is it restricted supply? No, because... You know, the, the 600 square metre block or the 800 square metre block down the road can knock down and build three new townhouses. So there's, they all fail the supply test. And so if you can get an asset that's got restricted supply, that's the first thing. And then you've got to flip, flip your head into demand. And no matter what sort of your personal position is, you've got to think, well, the demand of who else would want to buy this property whenever you own something. You know, if a single wants it, great, okay? Well, they're not going to ever, unless they've got lots of cash and lots of income, they're not going to be able to compete the mm-hmm. property price up. If a couple wants it, yeah, I mean, that's great, but they haven't got the emotional pool couples because, you know, they could always just go rent a one or a two bed somewhere. But if a sort of family wants it, well, yeah, they've got the emotional pool, they need something a bit bigger um, and they're willing to go on a lot of debt for security and stability. Um, but if it's a low income family, well, that's great. But if it's a high income family, well, then absolutely you've got really strong demand because they're going to have high incomes to be able to borrow a lot of money, but also they're willing to go in, um, put in a lot of their other assets. So thinking about things from a supply point of view, is it restricted? Is it shrinking? Then is the demand really appeal to high income families? And if it doesn't, then, you know, you've got to really wonder well, who's going to drive the price up long term. The only other market you'd really want to own the really want to want to own the property would be the downsizer market. So the people selling out of expensive homes, do they want to downsize into your place? If you can get that demand plus the family demand, um, potentially even second home demand as well, that to me is kind of the perfect property. Limited supply plus really strong demand. So what's the uh, what would be because I, I can visualize like a three or four bedroom house, two bathrooms, whatever for like the the in the inner city ring for um, that higher income family. But what about the downsizer? Like what would a typical downsizer uh, property look like? Look, if it's, if it's a real low maintenance sort of house, great. A lot of them do want sort of more easy living. So they'll look at more like garden apartments are perfect, you know, no stairs, a little bit of garden for their dog, for example, maybe a spare bedroom, you know, someone comes and stays over. Um, but also in a, in a premium area, what you want to do is a, well, downsize as they get to a certain age and they don't want to leave. And if you had a house in Mossman, let's just call it that, they don't want to move all the way, you know, regionally, a lot of them. They want to stay in Mossman. They've got their community and their friends, et cetera, but maybe they don't want a big house. So a garden apartment in, say, Mossman, for example, with no stairs, easy access with parking, easy access to the local shops, that matters more, you know, just walk down there, um, would be an amazing investment for them. That would also suit high-income families. Because a lot of high-income families in, say, Sydney can't afford to get into the housing market anymore because, you know, to get in anywhere near the city, it's, say, $2 million, right? So if they've got a budget of 1.5 to 2, they've got a choice to go to, say, Wollongong or the Central Coast or they go into a, you know, a nice, you know, garden apartment or something like that. 
So, and, and they're restricted because they're not really knocking down houses in Mossman to build apartments, um, as an example, because it's got a really strong NIMBY overlay. The councils are really controlling any new development. Um, whereas a garden apartment in somewhere like Waterloo or Alexandria, yeah, it suits downsizers, but downsizers don't want to move there. Families don't really want to move there. There's no um, restricted supply. Mm-hmm. Um, so we should also just cover off that it, we, when we talk about like the primary residence, um, there are certain tax rules that might apply to that versus an investment property. Um, can you just, just cover off those bases just in case people aren't aware? Look, I mean, the, the, the big thing with the property market is it's tax-free growth on your home, right? Um, you know, it'd be nice to be able to buy a share portfolio. Yeah, you can do it in retirement in your super fund and, you know, get it grow tax-free. But when you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, you know, there's not many, there's no other real assets that you can sort of buy and, and grow for you tax-free. Look, if you buy an investment property, um, you know, you can potentially use the, you know, CGT free. If you haven't got any other assets, you could live in an investment property for, you know, six months, for example, and move out and do something called the six-year rule. Um, can you explain but- that? Yeah, so basically the government sort of says you can have one property growing for you tax-free if it was your home and if you bought it as a home. So if you bought a property and you moved into it straight away, in the, in the, the ATO's eyes, that's your home. That, that gets classed as your principal place of residence. But what they say is you can potentially move out of that property for six years, i.e. you get a job interstate or you want to move overseas or you can't afford the mortgage and you want to rent something um, and still have that property grow for you tax-free. You couldn't go and buy another home um, and live in it and get that one growing tax-free. So you can only get one, but it's a really good option for sort of first-time buyers um, and first-time investors if they haven't got any assets growing tax-free is to sort of use the six-year rule. Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously with investment properties, just like shares, a lot of people forget this with shares. If you if you um, you know borrow some money and the interest costs on those are greater than what the income is on those investments, um, i.e. the rent or the dividends, um, then that loss can be claimed in your tax return. And that's obviously the negative gearing um, that people talk about with investment properties. Mm. Okay. Um, and so maybe just another thing that we should cover off just before we kind of like hit our stride with this. When we talk about leverage, we're talking about like mortgages on homes and that sort of stuff. Um, is there any, like, what are the, some of the things that people should consider when they are thinking about a, a mortgage? I know you are a mortgage broker, Wealthful is your business um, and you helped us get into our home. What are some of the considerations people sh- should take into account? With leveraging into into property, just even mortgages in general. Like let's let's imagine like someone like my age, around thirty, maybe even someone older, like forty or fifty. What are some of the yeah. considerations you might take into account? Look, the first thing is don't get so fixated on the bank and the product. Right, all the banks are pretty much offering the same product. Um, they're all basically offering a package prop, uh, product, which is say three four hundred dollars a year, which gives you an offset account. Right, mm-hmm. so don't get too delving into the detail about products because they're all pretty much competing on the same product. Right. Um, The first thing I think you've just got to understand um, is is how much money can you borrow, right? You know, and understand how the the banking sort of calculators work, Um, understand how lenders' mortgage insurance works. A lot of people try to save for a 20% deposit, but they don't really understand how LMI works. You know, what's a good price to enter? Is it 12% deposit, 10%, um, et cetera? Um, You know, you've really got to understand how to use things like offset accounts, um, and the benefits in doing so in terms of buffers and um, tax-free sort of uh, limits, et cetera. Um, you know, obviously there's fixed and you don't have to always go 100% fixed or 100% variable. You'd probably never do. I mean, at the moment we're going 100% variable for all clients because fixed rates are just not competitive. But over the last few years, we've been fixing, you know, 50, 60, 70% of most of our clients' loans. So, um, I mean, they're the, the, the basic things. Um, I mean, you've really got to take care of your credit file. I think this is where sometimes people get a little bit lazy with the, you know, keeping on top of their credit card repayments or, you know, forgetting that, you know, they've got a bill that they've sort of let go into arrears or something like that. So definitely keep your credit file. Um, but really understand how bank borrowing capacity works. A lot of people don't understand the small tweaks like getting rid of credit cards and getting rid of car loans and paying off your hex and, um, you know, keeping your living expenses within a reasonable limit, how these all affect how much money you can borrow. Mm. It's actually quite surprising how those small amounts of money, like they say they've got like a $5,000 credit card, can have a significant impact on how much you can borrow, right? It's like asymmetric how much, like it's not like for like, it's not like you got a $5,000 credit card, therefore $5,000 off your borrowing power. It's quite substantial, right? Yeah, and I think another, um, you know, a good number to think about is you can borrow six or seven times your income, right? That's where the, the DTI limits sort of start to kick in. Just for your listeners, that's gone down a lot. You know, back in say 2014, 
what was causing a lot of the last boom was an investor boom. And that's because investors could probably borrow at 10 to 12 times salary. You know, there were so many flaws in bank borrowing capacity across, and you could leverage across lots of different banks and get this huge amount of debt. That doesn't really exist anymore, right? So six or seven times your income is a really easy number. If you've got a 10 grand credit card limit, times that by about five or six, that's how much it reduces your borrowing capacity. It's not how much you owe, it's your limits. Hmm. If you sort of have a car loan of $1,000 a month, times it by about 150. You know, that's probably roughly how much it reduces your borrowing capacity. So $1,000 a month car loans, 150 grand off your borrowing capacity. Wow. And so absolutely, you know, when clients come to us is we look at it and go, well, if you did that or you did this, this is how your borrowing capacity would change. The big thing that drives it though is income because that's what you leverage at six or seven times. And you've got to be really careful of this. You know, we've got lots of clients who, you know, even one yesterday, you know, he's high paying CFO, um, you know, invested in a startup that he might transition to. And, but, you know, he needs to make his property decisions before he transitions because he's going to go from, you know, a big salary to a smaller salary. Um, and, you know, yes, there's incentives in terms of, you know, bonuses and all that sort of stuff. But a lot of banks need, you know, one to two years of new commission. So if you're in a high sort of commission industry, um, you've got to be careful swapping jobs because you're going to go from, you know, great bonus history to nothing. And then it's going to limit your borrowing money. If you're thinking about starting a business, try to make your decisions before that. Um, mm-hmm. you know, I found that out. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So there's just, you know, and it, it is a game of lending. Property is a game of lending. A lot of people think it's about finding assets. No, it's actually you, you, what you will be restricted by, what we're all restricted by is how much money you can borrow. Because there's always good assets, right? There's always good properties out there. As long as you're patient and you, you know what you're looking for, there's never, you're never like, you might not be able to buy something today, but there's always going to be something popping up forever in the future. What's going to always stop you is how much money you can borrow. So it's really understanding how do you sort of gamify that longer term, but not just borrowing the most money, but using buffers. Mm. reduce pulling equity out you know creating you know structuring your loans the right way to maximize tax efficiency these are all the things that you really need to focus on if you're trying to you know do something around property i think the other thing too which um kind of is on the other side of the ledger so if we go the other way you say like if you're reducing income but your income might also be increasing right so then um let's say you can't afford that quality asset now, maybe in 12 months or 24 months you can because you'll have more income. Like let's imagine like a, I don't know, late 20s or someone that's just transitioned into a new job or just a management role. And all of a sudden, you know, they've, the prospect of earning a lot more is coming out. And you're, you're just saying that rule of like how many times your income you can borrow, you might afford a better quality asset in 12 or 24 months. Not many brokers would do this. And this is, you know, not being arrogant at all. <laughs> the reality is brokers see themselves most of the time as transaction. And if you walk into a broker or a bank and say you want to borrow money, they're going to say how much you can borrow and let you go. Absolutely. We look at the opposite way. We go, right, okay, tell me about your job. Tell me about your income. What are you going to be earning in six to 12 months? Tell me about your savings. This is what you could do today. This is what you could do in a couple of years' time. This is the type of property you could buy, buy on today's income. You know what? If you just saved an extra 30 grand or you just got yourself an extra 30, 40 grand pay rise, it moves you from these type of assets, which are, you know, unlimited supply, not that great, really the affordability market, into these assets, which are restricted supply that really suit sort of high income couples and families and um, and will always stay in restricted supply. So absolutely, we're often telling clients, um, you know, just to wait, you know, just wait six months, um, just to either save more money, get more clarity is a big one as well. We find this with new relationships, especially when one partner's got a, a property and the other one. You know, I'm not successful until I get a property. We don't believe that nonsense. But, you know, a lot of people get drummed into them and then their partner's got a property. So they go and buy an investment property when they should be combining resources and doing things together. Um, so I think getting clarity on relationships or clarity around work um, is, is a big one while we talk clients to wait. So absolutely. It's, it's all about getting a quality asset. There's no point just, you know, the people who got caught out in 2022 and got caught out in 2018 uh, at the end of the last boom are people who bought into the FOMO any just bought, I've just got to get into any property because when the market shifts, like it has in the last three months, the people who get caught out are the people who have overpaid the things that aren't that special um, and the things that people at a comp- properties that are compromised. Because if they have to sell in 2022 or 2023, they're not going to unlikely be able to repeat the results they paid in 2021, let alone the stamp duty selling costs. Um, additional costs over renting, et cetera. So, um, yeah, it's all about just trying to get one quality asset, being patient rather than just trying to get in and just, you know, because thinking that all the market just lifts all ships. Well, when markets go the other way, the, it, it definitely see a huge gap in terms of what holds its value versus what it doesn't. 
I think that's a really important point you bring up there because people are, you know, they're thinking interest rates rising, not sure about my mortgage repayments, um, property prices in the news, whatever. Um, how much does the prospect of like interest rate movements over say two, three, five years factor into property strategy for you? Absolutely. I mean, it's a really interesting time. I mean, obviously, you know, the, the listeners on this podcast track all this stuff, right? That's why they're learning, right? And what we've seen is from the, the numbers of what interest rates may have gone up late last year, it wasn't that long ago, we're talking about negative interest rates, right? Um, yeah. You know, across the whole globe and that was coming and everyone believed that, right? Um, and how much they've gone in the last six months. You know, the, we saw a huge jump it's just into sort of January, February. Then you got all the stuff with Ukraine, et cetera. Bank fixed rates have gone through the roof. Like we were getting fixed rates around 2%. You're lucky to get in the threes now, um, maybe even in the fours. And so, um, you know, we're talking, and it's going to take some time. You know, the, the irony of this at the moment is that we're getting better variable rates than ever. We're getting sub 2% variable rates at some of the biggest banks, right? Um, which is crazy. You know, that that wasn't long ago when it was 2526, even when the RBA was at 0.1. So variable rates are super competitive but fixed rates are all out of market. Absolutely. Property is priced on how much money people have got, how much cash, and how much people can borrow. So borrowing capacity, uh, how much savings they've got has changed. Obviously, people have saved a lot in COVID. That's why people are in the market a lot more. Plus, mm. you've got things like the stupid 5% deposit schemes from the government and stamp duty exemptions and all that sort of stuff. So how much savings someone's got matters, how much money they can borrow. So borrowing capacity is a huge impact. When borrowing capacity is getting increased, i.e. when rates fall or APRA does a change or et cetera. Um, that, so at the moment, though, when interest rates go up, borrowing capacity is going to fall. So a big headwind, headwind for the property market. Every time the variable rate increases 1%, so from 2% to 3%, borrowing capacities will fall 10%. Hmm. So instead of being able to borrow $2 million, now you can only borrow 1.8, you know, and you're, you've still got your cash. But now, so that's going to have a huge impact on the market, um, especially in the affordability part where the incomes aren't going up to offset that. A lot of the, so that's the first. The second thing, interest rates. Not only is it um, how much money you can borrow, but how much money do you want to borrow, right? And so if you're worried about interest rates going up, you don't borrow to your limit, right? You be conservative. You want to protect yourself. And so when interest rates rate went to 2% and people believe they're going to stay there forever, not that we'd ever say that to our clients, but, you know, that perception was really in the market last couple of years, that they're going to stay low for a long time. That encouraged people to just take on an enormous amount of debt, you know? So when interest rates are rising, you know, from 2% to say 4%, borrowing capacities are falling. And for some people, their incomes aren't going up, right? You're going to see a huge repricing of the property market. And the properties that went up last year, in the last couple of years, due to low interest rates, not due to higher incomes, um, they're the properties are going to be in, in a lot more trouble, um, especially if incomes aren't going up in those areas. Yeah, it's really interesting. I've um, Chris, have you ever come across like studies which show basically buying quality versus not quality, like the the I guess the volatility in prices? Like it, I'd be fascinated to see like a chart of that over time to see how quality assets respond in volatility versus you know not quality. I know it's hard to slice and dice. Um, it'd be like saying quality shares versus not quality. Yeah, you know, you know, but that would be fascinating because I imagine you'd see less volatility in those blue chip so to speak. Uh, yeah, properties. so the data gets skewed. So the data gets skewed because in the downturn, right, which is going to happen like 2018 to 2019 was a very recent one that we can sort of apply learnings from. So in the downturn, um, the people that are scared about prices falling, if they know they haven't got a quality asset, right, mm. you go, well, I can sell it for, you know, 1.5 today, but prices are falling. Or I might only be able to get 1.3. If they start believing what CBA is telling us and, you know, Chris Joy, and very respected, I, I, I really track his stuff. But you, you watch where, you know, it was worth 1.5 and now but maybe 1.3 next year. And I know it's on a main road. No, it's dark. I'm more likely to sell. But if I've got a pro property in a great street, I know last year I could have sold it for 1.6. Um, it really suits my family. Yeah, I'd like a nicer place, but it's perfect. Um, it's got great light, great aspects. It's really quiet. It's great accessibility to the local, you know, amenity plus the transport. I just hold on. And so what you find out in these sort of down markets is a lot of the poorer and cheaper properties in suburbs sell. That drags down the median number. Um, and a lot of the quality assets dry up. Liquidity just makes it so hard to buy good assets because everyone sits on their hands. And so a lot of people thinking to this current boom is, oh, this is my opportunity. And this is what we saw when COVID hit. A lot of clients came to us, especially a lot in the banking sector as well, who, 
you know, you know, a bit worried maybe they should have gone in the property market earlier or they're thinking prices are going to fall. Kane drafts and I said, well, it's actually going to be really hard to buy something. Rates are also going down, but people aren't just going to rush for the hills, right? Mm. And so I think that's the issue with these down markets is, is that the medians drop, but it's because the quality of stock that's selling drops, not so much because the quality properties are dropping as much. Um, because what ends up in all the buyers become picky because they're like, um, prices aren't going up. So I can be patient mm. and you know what? Interest rates are going to go up. So why would I go into a lot of debt unless it's something I really love? So all the buyers sit on their hands unless they all wait for a quality property. And then all the seagulls, which is the buyers go for that one property and then that gets competition and then it's, it holds its value. And so in these down periods, I think that's what you'll find. That's the importance of having a quality asset, something that's easy to sell um, and will always have demand in any market rather than something that's, you know, was easy to buy, but really hard to sell in down markets. Mm. Yeah, I, I I hear you there, and I can imagine that. Like we talk about liquidity premiums, basically in investing in like shares and whatever in companies. There's for those people that are happy with the illiquidity of certain assets, then it can actually be work in your favour. Um, it's more so there's people that are stretched that kind of get uh, strung out. Uh, there might be one more thing that we might tack on to this uh, dis- discussion before we uh, hit, hit pause on this and then come back for the next episode where we talk about upgrading. But this is basically just getting your view on property um, as a capital growth asset or as income. You mentioned earlier on that maybe an apartment because of the supply constraints or lack thereof, an apartment might not be uh, the ideal long-term hold, but people see apartments and those types of places as good for income and good for yield. Like we talked, I talked to a lot of people that are in their forties or fifties and thinking, yeah, you know, I've got this house and I've held it for a few years. It's you know, blah, blah, it's gone up this much, but I'm thinking of buying this other one because it's on a 4% yield or something like that. And it's, you know, in apartment building. How do you think about that? We, uh, I've never, the income in, in property is first, you've got to pay uh, you know, property managers. Then you've got to pay maintenance and um, repairs. Um, then you've got to, you know, pay tax on income, right? It's fully taxable in that tax return. And so incomes or property is already a low yielding investment. You know, commercial property is better, high income shares, you know, dividends. So property, residential property is low yielding. Yeah, it might be a better yield, but unfortunately, even if you get, say, two properties, one property rents out a thousand bucks a week and one does 600 bucks a week, which is the better property. A lot of people say, oh, a thousand dollars a week property. Well, no, I mean, yeah, it's an extra $400 a week, um, which is 20 grand a year. But after tax, that's not really only 12 grand a year, right? So that property is making you 12 grand extra. What really determines whether that's a better property is how do those properties go up over the next 10 years? You know, because if you made 12 grand extra over 10 years, that's 120 grand. Might be a lot, it might seem like a lot of money. But if that other property goes up by more than 120 grand, um, you know, or and then minus off capital gains tax, then that'd be a better property. So property absolutely is a is a capital um, growth play. You'll never ma- you'll never make a lot of money on 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 income because it's just so low yielding, you lose it all in tax anyway. Um, I guess the key thing is, is that if a property gets more expensive from a capital growth point of view, less people can afford to buy it. For example, you think about houses in, in Sydney, right? Less people can afford to buy houses from an investment point of view and also home buyers. And so less every year there's less houses for rent because they always sell to home buyers. Um, there's less on the market to rent um, and less people can afford to buy them. So more people are forced to rent them. And so, yeah, it's a low yielding asset, but what ends up happening is rents go up over time. So the yield today might be say 2%, on today's price, but if that rent goes up, that yield on the purchase price goes up. And so what you want to do is get a a strong capital growth asset will also very much tie into a strong income growth asset within um, limits um, because you can keep putting your rent up. And so it's not today's yield you want to focus on with residential, it's future yield, which is future increases in rent. Plus, but the most important thing that will drive future increases in rent is capital growth. Because if you think about it, if if you own a property, and the landlord kept putting your rent up every year, at some point you would say, hang on a sec, it'd be cheaper to buy this thing. But the reason they can keep putting the rent up is you, they know you can't afford to buy it because mm. it's $3 million. And even though it's $1,500 a week rent. And so absolutely, income doesn't work. What you want to do with property is, is, is go 100% in all in on capital growth. Yeah, you want to get some type of yield because you want to offset your mortgage, right? But, you know, you don't want to sacrifice higher yield for smaller capital growth. Mm. Um, yeah, and that's and, and that's a big mistake. I mean, a lot of investors, um, you know, want to be. Oh, I don't want it to cost me anything. You know, I want to pay off my mortgage, etc. But even if you do make a loss on property of, you know, ten thousand dollars a year, right? That's a hundred thousand dollars over ten years. 
what does that mean that you get to own over that 10 years? And rents will probably go up over that 10 years to I mean the next 10 years, the loss will be smaller, right? Um, so yeah, it's, it, that's how we sort of believe it. It's, you, what you want to do is buy assets that are likely to go up in a lot over the longer term. Um, you actually reminded me of something that, um, as you're saying that, that I, I've kind of observed from the property market over say the last two decades. So um, full disclosure, I'm 31, um, which I don't think I've ever said that on the podcast before, but um, I remember when basically everyone shot for properties in like the local papers or the local like magazines that would come out uh, once a week or whatever, or once a month. And I feel like price discovery in markets and property markets has really just like, it's made it that in the past, you know, you might be able to find a, a, Mm. Um, a, a property being sold by a bank, you know, foreclosure, whatever you want to call it. Um, whereas now everyone knows the value or relative value of a property because we've got things like REA Group, you know, Call Logic, all these data providers yeah. out there. And it's made it more like competitive. So basically, more and more, I this is just my observation, could be way off the mark, you might disagree. Is that like that time arbitrage is basically what you're playing on? Like, how do I? hold this asset for as long as possible to get the maximum benefit from it um, rather than trying to, you know, flip houses and then sell it for more next year. I think property data is an interesting one because you can really build, uh, and this is the big problem, the property market's unregulated, right? And then if people get access to all this data and then they build a pitch off this data, this is your yield, this is the capital growth over the last yeah, 10, right. 20 years and, you know, and this is what it's going to be over the next 10, 20 years, which I think is all nonsense, Right. Um, and you know that that is that's the real issue I think with with property data is that people start getting focusing on the data and they always want to make their spreadsheets work, but they forget of the human element, the, the what an asset is really is. Is it restricted supply? Does it really appeal to sort of the family market? Is there anything about it that people aren't going to like? You know, a main road, floor plan, light, privacy, um, you know, etc. Streetscape, you know, and so you've got to overlay the art of property. I would say. Um, together with the science, you know, yeah, you do want a property that's had a long, really long, strong track record of growth, right? And, you know, and we do look at all only established property for our clients. We don't go and buy a new property at all. So, you know, we'll always look for, you will see that with any quality asset that it has. But um, yeah, I mean, that's the problem with data. I think it is that people start all of a sudden to pitch things and they start, you know, buying anywhere because they get all these sort of yield and they um, potential capital growth that's been driven off low interest rates in these markets. And, rather than the fundamentals behind them. Mm, that's a good point. Um, so just to recap on this episode, we talked about basically using your property strategic in multiple ways. One, you can live in it. Two, you can use it as a secured asset that you can then do other things with from a financing point of view and you can leverage in it. Uh, we talked about the difference between high quality and not high quality, basically. Um, the, the tax implications of owning a, your home to live in versus, say, uh, you know, investment property, a uh, six-year rule. We'll talk about maybe some of the differences with like SMSFs and people using super uh, later on. Uh, then, then we just basically talked about, you know, how you can structure loans, why prices go up and why prices of some properties like high quality assets maybe aren't as, I guess, elastic to, um, you know, volatility. And, and then you're not going to see as much of a, not that you won't see a downturn, but you might see um, less volatility in those prices. So this is a lot to go on from one episode. In the next episode, we're going to talk about upgrading to people that may already have a house. Uh, how can they think about that? Uh, and what, what can they do to their home as well? Um, we're going to talk about first-time investors in the episode after that. And then we're going to talk about people that build portfolios. So those portfolio investors, as well as where they go wrong, which I think is really important too, because a lot of people get one, they get two, and then I think, why not three, four, or five? Um, and finally, we'll talk about the end game or at least later stage um, property investing. So Chris uh, from Wealthful, thanks for joining me for episode one. Looking forward to the next one, mate. Chat soon, mate.